Hey there, you're tuned in to MEA Worldwide. I'm your host, Elena Jordan, and today I am sitting down with one of the hardest working women in show business, Karen Strasman. That's really sweet. Uh, it's true. You have one of the longest resumes of anybody that I know, and everything that you do is absolutely fantastic. One of the coolest things about you, though, is that you are also an international celebrity too because you're able to not only light up our screens on creep show preacher here but also you got your start in france yes that is true you're so <laughs> sweet <Alana. laughs> i've missed you we've, we've actually gotten to interview once before so i've missed you're you a so lot sweet. <laughs> But yeah, so tell us a little bit about how that started, because I know that you went to France originally um, for school and got your degree in psychology and in theater over there, and then just kind of started from dialect coach into voiceover. Walk us through that progression. Well, I, I went over there to study and learn a new language, um, because, I, you know, it's just, um, I'm part Danish, so I grew up, we'd go home to Denmark for vacations, and... I just, I just felt like I wanted to go somewhere else and widen my horizons a little bit. And so I went to France to study for a year. And while I was studying theater and French and, and psychology, you've done your research, lady. <laughs> um, and, um, and while I was there, I saw um, an ad on a little bulletin board for a studio that was looking for American actors to follow an apprenticeship as a dialect coach for a studio that existed in France that doesn't exist anymore called Studio VOVF that coached French actors to act in English for the camera um, because there were so many co-productions that come into town in France and actors in France need to be able to act in English in order to book those kind of jobs. So I took the apprenticeship and it I was just really good at it. I mean, it was a fluke. <laughs> and there's a lot of things I'm not very good at, so it was very lucky. Um, but and, and they offered me a full-time job the following year as one of their main dialect coaches, as the second dialect coach. And I thought, well, I can go back and get my psychology degree in the United States where I can stay here in Paris, in the middle of the city, in my little apartment near Saint-Michel, right near Notre Dame with my little um, big brown bike that I ride everywhere and stay here another year and coach actors. And um, so I did, and while I was doing that, they also sent me to set to coach actors on set. And one of the directors for one of the TV shows I was um, coaching on, he said, oh, little Karen, she's so cute, we give her a role. So <laughs> I got a role in a French TV show and I got an agent and um, I just ended up being really, really happy there and I enrolled in the French National Royal Conservatory of Acting, which is like the biggest acting school in France where the government actually funds you to go there. And so I studied, you know, French theater in French, so I got to... I wouldn't say perfect my French, but you know, I got pretty damn good. Um, and, and I studied Moliere and even Shakespeare in French and Racine and all of the classics and fencing and voice work and I learned horseback riding there. It was really, really magical. So what brought you back to the States? Um, I was, I should put this over my shoulder, I guess, right? Um, I. So I was doing television and film and theater and a lot of voiceover there. What, what brought me back to the States is that um, my mom died at the age of 59 of cancer. And she got cancer at the age of 56. And it was a time in my life where I realized, you know, shit happens. And I thought, you know, life is not always as we expect and might not be as long as I expect. And I kind of went, are there things that I've always wanted to do that I have put off? Or are there dreams that I've had that I've ignored? And I kind of made a mental list and looked through and I realized that ever since I was a little girl, I'd always wanted to work in, in American TV and movies. And I was kind of, I, things were going so well in France that I didn't really think about it. And I also had this little voice in my head saying, you're not pretty enough, you're not talented enough, you're not good enough. And so it just seemed safer to avoid that. And I thought, 
you know, life is maybe shorter than, and I have a choice. I have a choice is just to stay here and enjoy the lovely life that I have, except that I wasn't growing as much creatively anymore because I'd gotten in a comfort zone, or um, take a risk. And I, I did that deathbed exercise where I imagined myself on my deathbed going, would I regret more um, just not going and never knowing? Or would I regret more going and failing? And I realized that it would, I would regret more never having tried for my dream. I love that. And I thought so even, even if I fail, that would be better than never daring to try. So um, I, at an older age, I went to Hollywood. I came here. Um, I knew one person. I knew one person. And I just, I just, you know, somebody said, meet this person. And I, you know, uh, because I had had years and years of voiceover and a lot of experience, I got a voiceover agent very quickly. And because I'd been doing so much TV and film, I did get a on-camera agent very quickly. And, you know, I just, walk the walk and I got into American acting classes and I took meetings and I just did student films and you know kind of had to start out all over again in some ways um, but I, I have never regretted it for a second. Well you have definitely definitely succeeded <laughs> by uh, all accounts. Uh, you mentioned you kind of made a mental list of some things to check off what are some of the things that you are most proud of that you can kind of put that check mark by because You've done everything. You've done video games. You've done, you know, drama. You've done comedy. You've done horror. You've done everything. I mean, when people are going to celebrate in France and go to the Louvre, you're the voice that they hear going through. I mean, it's well, I don't incredible. know if it is anymore, but yeah. But I mean, you. I mean, you have been making impact on people's lives for years now, what are some of the accomplishments of your many, many, many that you have that you personally are most proud of? Um, I'd say um, when my nieces and nephews were little kids, going to their house um, up in San Francisco and hearing them say, Auntie Karen, will you read us a book and will you do the voices? Aww. Um, and getting to do those voices for them and seeing them laugh and smile. That's probably my biggest accomplishment. <laughs> and your versatility is just absolutely amazing. Every time that I see you or hear you, it's a complete, it's never Karen. It is a full character that you have completely fleshed out. It's insanely amazing. Okay. What is your process for, for that? I mean, because you've done such diverse things, do you have a different process when you're going in for voiceover than when you're going in for live action? Um, I, th I think it's, I think it's about, I'm most successful at it because I have different processes that haven't worked as much in the past. I'd say um, the, the formula for not working is trying to do the right thing and please people. The formula that really seems to work is when I approach it, like a, a kid and go like, what would be fun here? You know, so if I approach it like a kid and go, you know, you know, if I, you know, if I were an evil villain, what would I be like? You know, if I was, you know, a little gnome, what would it be like to be a gnome? And, and I think <laughs> approaching it from a playful perspective, you know, um, when I did a uh, preacher and I played the evil German scientist, um, uh, Dr. Lois Slotnick, um, when I did the audition, they didn't even know what they wanted when they put out the audition. And um, when I auditioned, they just wanted some scientist. And I was the one who thought, I, and I did an audition, and I thought it was okay, an American voice and everything. And I said to the person who was taping me, I said, you know what? I'm just jonesing to do this, just for myself, with a German accent, because it just, it feels like it would work. And, and we did, and we looked at it, and we were like, that's kind of cool, let's submit that. And, oh and, that, and that's what booked. Um, I and, had no idea that you came up with Dr. Slot being yeah, German. Yeah, yeah. I just always assumed that was in the script. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Wow. They, we altered, they altered the script a little bit. When I got on set, we talked about the character <sighs> and stuff. Yeah. 
I yeah. heard that you even helped pick out the glasses and everything yeah, too, right? Yeah, yeah. The director and I went and we looked at you know what would be the exact right glasses, and that is kind of what made the character pop. Um, and, and also that kind of stuff, like for me, a lot of the times, not always, but you know, props and costumes, it, you kind of like, you kind of like settle inside it and you know, oh, you know, all of a sudden you're inside another human being that has parts of me in it. You know, and it's sort of the same thing, very much the same thing for the character I just did in Creep Show. Yes, I cheap to white ask you. trash Leslie Ann, <laughs> Leslie Ann Dowd, who come, who who gets her comeuppance. I won't say how, um, but that was so much fun. Um, because how was that working with the puppeteers and everything too? Like how <sighs> they are? I I think um, they're some of the most talented and well-known puppeteers for creatures and stuff yeah. in, in the business. And when I was working directly with them, um, we were, they had built like a scaffolding. I, I won't give too much away, but you'll probably see pictures online where we, ha we had our heads through the scaffolding and the creatures, I won't say what they are for people who haven't, but who, but they were puppeteering. So we were, our bodies were underneath the scaffolding and um, our heads were outside and they had the creatures um, on top of the scaffolding and they were lying underneath the scaffolding, you know, manipulating them so they couldn't even see what was going on. And it's part manual manipulation, part electronic. And so they had these creatures coming at us that were completely electronic and terrifying and, and you know, and they really, they would puppeteer them from, they're lying on their backs on this apple box and we're all squinched up together. And I think I have my leg around one of the puppeteers because we're all squished up underneath there. And it, there, it's just brilliant, ah. brilliant and covered with blood. And, but I... but that, that, that character was super fun because I got to like, I think I grew up um, really thinking that I had to be like a good girl. So anytime I get a role <laughs> where I don't have to be one, I think it's really fun and freeing for me. Um, You're so good at playing the villain too. <laughs> <laughs> but this character, um, I decided that I wanted her to have, you know, she's cheap white trash, a hairdresser. So we gave her this big, big bouffant hairdo, a lot of heavy, heavy, fun makeup. And I decided I wanted to have really long nails like Kathy Baker in Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> and I talked to Costume Wardrobe about, about that and they said, yeah, that would be great. So we put on these really long nails, the only problem, which was so much fun, because again, that in itself created the character. I love how involved you are in the you know? whole process of creating these characters. I mean, it, it really shows because mm -hmm. you just become these people. It's, it's really Amazing. Fun. It's so much fun. I, I mean, it's like I feel like a kid playing make believe. Did you yeah. ever read the comics for Creepshow or for Preacher beforehand? Um, I saw some of the movie beforehand and, and I watched um, John Harrison, who directed my episode, who mm -hmm. was um, completely involved in the 80s version. I think he was an AD and assistant director, and, um, and he directed my episode. So I watched a lot of the stuff that he'd done. Um, and all that really kitsch horror, um, yeah. and it's just ugh, so much fun. I, um, I have to ask you too, because you are definitely a very accomplished actress in all of English language productions, uh, but, and also, you know, your, your deep ties to French and French culture, but you have done so many anime dubs. You have become, become kind of a, a Japanese icon. Do you uh, do you study Japanese at all? Do you are you kind of into any of the the Japanese culture as well? And how did that come about that you started becoming the voice of so many iconic characters in so many animes? It just it was one of those things. Like the thing about me becoming a dialect coach in Paris, it just happened. You know, I, I came I arrived here in the States and I had all these voiceover skills and somebody said, oh, you should do anime and recommended me for a job and I auditioned for it and I booked it. And then that director said, oh, you're really good at this. You should do this job. And they recommended me and I auditioned for it and I booked it. And it just, it just happened. You know, and I didn't go like, oh, you know, I want to, and I didn't really even know too much about it. So I had a real education in doing it. You know, I just, I really, I just, 
love voiceover and I just love cartoon characters and all that so it's just another genre for me and I've had a couple opportunities almost to go to Japan to do motion capture yeah. and stuff like that there and um, either they didn't go through or I, I had another gig and I had to choose between them so I still haven't been to Japan and I really really look forward to that and I've learned a lot about Japanese culture through anime but it's really it's it's like it's anime that has been my window into into Japanese culture and you know now I work with a lot of Japanese clients and kind of feeling that culture and enjoying that and you know and and I, I just I feel Oh, I learn a lot from them, and I learn a lot from the fans who know a lot, often more than I do, about it. Do you have it. a favorite series now that you've you've been in so many? Oh, I, there's so many that I love for so many different reasons. One that I'll quote, which is not as well known, but it's probably my favorite anime that I've done ever, is called Monster. Monster, yes. And for hardcore fan, core fans, it's just it's, and I think Guillermo del Toro is going Nina to make Fortner. it into a movie once. Nina Fortner, you're good. <laughs> Holy cow. Monster is great though. Here, I mean, Nina is That's, fantastic. It's, I think so. it's my favorite anime that I've ever done and it's it's too bad that it didn't get as much distribution because I just think it's it's a it's a real, there's there's a lot of anime like that of any shows are great entertainment but there's a lot of anime series that are literal art and that to me is an art. Um, but there's there's just Oh, like I still have a huge affection for uh, affection for Code Geass yes. and Colin, um, Bleach where I play Soyphone, a Lucky Star where I played Miyuki is just so endearing. Um, you know, Hunter X Hunter has been really fun. There's just, uh, you know, and I'm gonna like leave you today and go. I should have mentioned this, that, and you know. <laughs> Um, and Persona also, I have a real affection for both um, Igus and um, and Nanako, and fans just have a huge affection for yes. them. So, is it ever overwhelming when you go out to conventions and things and seeing people all dressed up as your characters? Um, it's just sweet. It's so oh. it's so sweet, and, and also because when we work, we're in the studio, so I'm in the studio with an engine, sound engineer and the director, and then maybe maybe a whole bunch of clients or maybe clients on the phone. Um, but it's a very isolated process. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not even aware that people, that it touches people or that people care about it, you know, until I, you know, get, you know, social media messages and stuff from fans or until I go to conventions. And, and you know, it's, it's really humbling to see how much these things affect people's lives. You make a big impact, that mm -hmm. is for sure. Also in video games, which are such a huge, huge culture too, do you ever play any games as yourself? Have you ever played and interacted with yourself? I am such a bad <laughs> geek. I'm a horrible geek. I'm like, I, I really need to like up my game. <laughs> um, I get so busy because just in terms of all of the work I'm doing, you know, in preparing auditions and learning lines late at night, you know, it, that I just, I haven't had time to play games. Although apparently um, the cast from Resident Evil 2, the, yes. you know, the game that just it came is. out, we're going to be playing it together and doing a thing online or something. Fine. Yeah, Yeah, I just had dinner with all of them last night and we're going to be doing a, a thing where we play like so, but I don't. I don't have time. I think I played Mortal Kombat a couple years ago at a con, and I was I was horrible at. I like I, I was horrible at it. Uh, my nephew is a gamer, and um, he's kind of tried to explain to me how some of that works. And I'm just like I need to take a class or something. Well, since you have lent your voice to mm. so many different projects all over the spectrum. Has there ever been a time that you've been caught off guard and heard your own voice in something and gone, oh wait, that's me? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've sometimes flipped the channel on, a, on an airplane looking for a film or TV to watch and like t twice it's happened that I think once was Silicon Valley and I was, <laughs> and I, <laughs> um, sometimes uh, sometimes I won't recognize my voice when they will play us a voice reference during a recording and they'll go, oh, this is, this is the character if I hadn't done it for a while. And I'll be like, 
really? That are you sure you didn't get the wrong actor in that? That's, and I'd be like, no, 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 that's you. And that's kind of that's fun when that happens. I love that you've done so many voices. There are times that you literally don't even recognize your own voice. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. Well, there's so much to keep up with with you. Where can fans keep up with you online? Um, fans can keep up with me on Instagram, at Karen Strassman. Twitter, at Karen Strassman. Uh, fan page, uh, my Facebook fan page, Karen Strassman fan page. <laughs> um, and I have a website, KarenStrassman.com. I'm, I'm lucky because I don't think there's anybody in the world who has my name, so I get to use it for myself. I feel like maybe you've just done so many things. Anyone who did have the name just changed it. They were like, she's one. She's the <laughs> only Karen Strassman. There can be one. <laughs> but, Anna, you, you, um, you've done your homework. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. It's just I love getting to talk to you. I love getting to talk to you, too. Thank you so much yeah. for coming yeah. in. And thank you guys for tuning in as well. You can check out more of our interviews at MEA Worldwide. That's MEAWW.com. Until next time, I'm Elena Jordan. Have a good day.